welcome to the Ask You Creek uh, author talk. We are authors from the Ask You Creek uh, bookshop in the Shamanus Public Market um, here on Vancouver Island. We have 40 authors, all of whom have written, sweated, and poured over at least one book, sometimes many, in order to bring their readers the best possible novel, memoir, poetry, short story collection, or nonfiction book that they can. And today we're talking to Lynn Hancock. Uh, welcome to you, Lynn, and to our viewers today. For those of you who are watching us on YouTube, please click like and subscribe um, and hit the notification button to make sure you don't miss any of our author interviews. Okay, Lynn, so let's start off talking about you and your writing in general, and then we'll move on to talking about your book. Um, are you a Vancouver Island native? Very much so now, but I was an Australian where I was born, but it's right. because of Vancouver Island that I'm here. I got engaged on my first date a few days before I was going back to Australia to be a university professor, met a man, tall, dark, handsome man, David Hancock, the eagle guy, and right. he said, come to Vancouver Island. I didn't even know where it was. And the first things he said is we're going to Vancouver Island before we met up on a first date counting eagles in Barclay Sound Islands was welcome to God's country. So that's Vancouver Island, where we all call home. That is my home now. That was okay. 1960s. Wow. So you've been on Vancouver Island, or you've been in British Columbia almost as long as I have. <laughs> yeah, 1960, 19, 1962, I, I got here. Wow. So Vancouver Island is really a hotbed of writers. Um, what do you think draws writers to the island? Um, I think it's because it's not the mainland, but could I say, um, just read five lines to you from a book oh, absolutely. Up there with the cougar, because mm -hmm. it says exactly the answer, and I looked it up today. Um, I, I want, I'm on Little Darth, I lived at, I lived at, uh, my first 10 years, I lived at Island View Beach, which is in central Saanich. Mm -hmm. and we look across to Little Darcy Island and Big Darcy Island and they were leper colonies. And um, I'm going to read to you just some lines from the book where I used to run with my cougars on Little Darcy Island. For some, an island confines. For me, it liberates. It appeals to my sense of romance, exotic, sentimental, optimistic, unrealistic. There's something about an island that fulfills all my fantasies. An island floats between realities. Like a stage, it provides suspension of belief. Physically separated from the rest of the world, one can feel mentally separated as well, drifting in some forest of Arden. So I wrote that in 1970. <laughs> that is beautiful. And I can certainly relate to, to your feeling of, of um, an island giving you freedom. I feel much the same way. Um, so did did this location impact um, the, the things that you have been writing? Oh, yes. Well, I wrote the first book was called There's a Seal in My Sleeping Bag. And that's uh, me discovering all these other islands around Vancouver Island because David Hancock, that I married, I accepted the invitation and sent a telegram home to my mother, met the perfect man, please prepare a wedding for next Saturday. And she did in Australia. And wow. on the other side of the world, and then I came back, and then I found myself in 10 years marriage with a lot of animals, which was totally different from anything before. Um, so uh, we, but we traveled a lot, traveling around, studying the seabirds of Triangle Island and puffins and murres and uh, cougars and all these animals that were on these islands. And I wrote books about them. All my books come from personal experience. I, I write nonfiction. And uh, although some of the, some of the uh, librarians, when they read some of these extraordinary to, um, adventures, are all true. I only write the truth, even when it hurts. And the librarians have been known to put me in the fiction, not the nonfiction. <laughs> so uh, that's I write. I write. I write what I have. And I'm, in the first 10 years of my life, I had all these wild animal orphans with educational permits to look after. And I had to, um, David was going, was going to university. Uh, and so I had to earn the money. And so I had to teach. So I uh, I've, I've taught for um, 
12, 15 years, and I've only ever taught what I wanted to teach. We all, the kids and I all made up our own curriculums, mm -hmm. uh, curriculum, and I had animals in the classroom and they wrote diaries and they wrote, they, they wrote diaries, they wrote stories, they did research. It, the animals came into every subject and that's why we made our own curriculum. And they, some of them are writers today because of those early experiences. One of my books, An Ape Came Out of My Hat Box, or the story of Gypsy, a given ape um, that I had to look after, um, she, uh, she was in the classroom the whole school year, every day. Wow. And the kids wrote a book. One kid wrote a book. Well, she's a, a professional writer now here in Nanaimo. And she wrote a book called um, Guess Who Goes to Our School? And it has was 13 chapters. So I, I've been very, you know, you have to feel useful in life. So I've, the, I, these adventures all come to me. I don't go searching for them. I mean, I was interested in history and I wanted, I was traveling, I was going, I was on the way to England in 19, April, I remember the date. In April the 18th, 1960, I left Australia to see the world. And I, all, I, all I was interested then was in seeing countries, but seeing English countries and seeing England and, um, uh, I knew all about the kings and the queens of England, and I was uh, in love with royalty and, and history. And that was my passion. And so uh, I, I jumped, but then I found something. I, I jumped ship in Cape Town. I saved it since I was eight years old to go to England. Uh, my, na my nana, I take after my nana, my grandmother, thank you, nana, because she, in the 1890s, she was born one of 10 children in Chichester, and she saw in the Strand in London a notice, and it said, go to boat, take a boat to Australia, Western Australia, and it was a convict colony, and she went in the 1890s over there. That's pretty gutsy for a single girl alone in those days. She invited her favorite sister, and the favorite sister said, um, uh, got chickened out the night before. And, and so she went alone. But when she got there, see, I think I have a practical side as well. <laughs> she married the head of the convicts. No, no, not the head of the convicts. She married the superintendent <laughs> of the convict colony right. on, on Rottenest Island. That's the other island that's very much part of my. Um, part of my life, Ireland's, and she married. She married the top, the top brass, and um, she's dead now, of course. But I had the passion. But she gave me a shilling a week or something. I was eight, and I saved it assiduously until I was um, 24, 22, and I um, got a boat to go to England. But I never got there by boat. I jumped ship at the first port of call. Something you couldn't do now. I mean, I've been back to Cape Town several times and my gosh, the things you have to go through now to be able to get in and out of the country. I just walked in and then I went up to um, uh, put my clothes in the, in the um, youth hostel. And then I it was raining on Cape Mountain, there was a tablecloth on, on the mountain behind Cape Town. And so I went into parliament, never been into parliament before. And that is the first chapter of um, the, my latest book called I Married an Egyptian. We won't have time to put to go into that, but, um, but the, um, uh, I've written that. I, I, I've written that, but I haven't got past it because nowadays writers have to know all about social media, and that I'm not good at. <laughs> I've, I've gone on too much and haven't let you speak. Yeah, nobody tells you when you start writing a book that there is far more to it than actually just writing the book. Well, I had my diaries. I mean, I have uh, I, I have diaries and pieces of paper, and this this little diary here. Um, is uh, I, I didn't know life was going to be so exciting in British Columbia. So you oh my goodness! That it's pretty quite cramped. But I I was sitting in an eagle's nest. Mm -hmm. when I wrote that. And I climbed the two hundred foot tree uh, on the west coast of Vancouver Island in the Barkby Sound, where we were studying eagles. And I climbed into the tree and there was a nest with two eagles in it. How I climbed into that tree is absolutely, oh, I was helped up a bit. I mean, there was somebody ahead of me and, and if I'd fallen, I would have, but I still climbed. And then when you get to the top of a tree, you have to get over the edge. And I, I'm at fear heights, but somehow it seems amazing now. But in my first year of marriage here to David Hancock, I got into, sat in this tree with two eagles. And at that time, eagles were getting killed they were predators any animal that ate another animal man thought was we're going to kill them uh, shoot them and and so eagles were being shot but um and and they were they were they were given they were thought of as being vicious 
Uh, however, they're not. And, uh, and uh, the, two, the parent eagles watched me for nine hours with, uh, my, with their two little babies were on my, on my lap. Why did I spend nine hours? Because I wanted a picture of this and that day it was raining and I hadn't brought my camera. So um, that's why I, when I wrote this story about not called nine hours in an eagle's nest, that's why I spent the time. And then the person with the didn't bring the camera. He had a trouble, another problem he, and he didn't get there till midnight. So I came down in the dark and didn't have a picture. So, but that article start, was my first article and people wrote, uh, also wrote a interviewed me about it and that attracted the attention of a publisher and that's how I got into writing uh, so William Collins read it and uh, and sent me a ticket to meet him in Toronto he wanted me to write a book on on eagles and I and I didn't know that you didn't uh, argue with publishers I said no I've got I have I want to write about eagles I want to write about cougars and I had already written these two yellow sheets of paper <laughs> this is we're talking about 1963 or something like that these two sheets of paper are um, my my experiences with cougars because if I if I ever was going to write a book I was always going to write that and I in fact in fact uh, when five when my husband brought back brought it opened the window one night um, uh, I was in bed, he, he came in midnight and the, uh, the window slowly raised above my head and uh, I'd rather read it than uh, the window slowly raised above my head and a man came through the window and it was David, he lost his front door keys and this is a way of introducing me to four cougar kittens. I've never seen cougars before, people were shooting cougars, cougars were regarded as vicious etc and I spent the night in bed with four cougars and one husband. And I thought somebody should write a book about that. That's the first idea for, well, actually somebody else should write a book about that. So, and, and then, so when, when Sir William Collins read that nine hours in an eagle's nest and said to write a book on eagles, I said, no, I want to write about cougars. Cause I said, oh, look, I've got two, these two yellow pages I've started. He said, no, Joy Adamson is writing about lions and, in Africa and you can't write about lions in Canada. And um, uh, I want a girl. I'm looking for a woman that is um, a girl, a, a woman, and it's in two countries, not just Africa, and, uh, and writing about something different. So I wrote a seal in my sleeping bag, which was a compromise. It wasn't Google, <laughs> and it, but it was eagles and other animals as well. Mm -hmm. So that, but my personal experiences that have been all, always, and then when I, and, the, and the book I'm trying to write now would be the one where I hitchhiked to London for the next five months, mm. and it's all about apartheid, but it's also because of Black Lives Matter that we're talking about now, um, I see that I, I got two trips, um, and I have to see how to intermingle them, and I want to do this 1960 trip with the 2013 trip. And the trips that I, I go every year now but the publisher wants me not to do that she, they want me to intermingle them more and I'd, I'd start with the, the present one and go back so yeah, I'm not sure how to do it but right. that, that, that subject matter anyway and black lives matter now and I didn't I mean when I went to parliament uh, I, I was in parliament I was invited invited by the I was just I was, I was just um, on the, um, I was, uh, I went into Parliament. I went up to the visitors' gallery, and it was a time when nine policemen had been shot, and the Sharpeville shootings, and there was a, a height, a height of um, uh, apartheid, and the world was against South Africa, and I'd wander in there not knowing anything about blacks and whites. In fact, they told me I came from White Australia. White Australia, I said. And then I, I didn't realize, I found out later, we had a white Australia official policy of apartheid in Australia, but I didn't know about it. Nobody else, I, I doubt you or anybody else around here would know about it. I just certainly didn't know about it. And so we had our own, I just grew up in a white world. Mm -hmm. And then I, in Africa, I have grown, I, I have, I'm now in a family of uh, Egyptians and I am, um, I mean, I have families all over because I like, when I travel, I like meeting not staying in fancy hotels, I like meeting the people of the country. And so I've been meeting black people. And so now I want to write a book where I'm exploring my change. Right. So what, what were uh, some of the, besides your actual experiences, what were some of the early influences that you had in your writing? I used to say, fifth to thirty, third socks, this is 
<laughs> I had a lisp. So that was an early influence on my writing because I, I, when I, I was not very popular at school. They used to call me Dr. Know Nothing because I was always top of the class. I was always doing nothing else but learning. And I had my, I had my head in a book and I was learning about the kings and the queens of England. I was learning Shakespeare. I didn't understand what Shakespeare was, what, what the words were, but I said them beautifully because I started with a lisp and I had a lot of speech education to get rid of the lisp. And it wasn't, an, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know I had the lisp, but so interested in, in speech and drama and acting that is the early influences and and reading interested in reading and swatting we called it swat is w-o-t and to get rid of the lisp i was sent to the convent and i was a very much a protestant i was sent to the nuns at a, at a, at a catholic convent and the, the um, i was told to put my um when you you don't you you don't know where you put your tongue tip tip again you put, you put your tongue tip against your top teeth ridge when you say the word S, but you don't, they're all automatic movements and you're not thinking about it. But when I do that, I go, this, the the so the song doesn't sound right. So I had to put my, they found a way by putting my tongue tip against my bottom teeth ridge. And that's what I do automatically now. But to make something automatically like that, I had to go to a convent where the people don't, nuns don't talk to each other. It's silent most of the time. And I had to make, do, I had to train my brain through saying nonsense syllables like, you know, get practice my C, E, C, E, C, E, C, E, S, E, A, S, A, S, A. And I just said nonsense syllables until my brain got this new movement. And then I came out and I could get my diplomas and um, as a teacher of speech and drama. Uh, so that that's for how I write is dramatically, but then the subject matter is, <laughs> that I bump into is always dramatically. So life gets in the way in a good way, I hope. Mm -hmm. And I can see behind you, you have uh, some pictures and uh, stuffies of raccoons, which might oh, be a good Tabasco. segue into your book, which yeah. is called Tabasco, right? Tabasco, the saucy raccoon. Mm -hmm. You can see a bottle of Tabasco sauce up there. Yes. <laughs> Um, yes, I. That was that's my late my, my last book, Tabasco the Saucy Raccoon, and that's one I'm very anxious to um, find homes for, um, because the publisher is no longer in business, and I've got all the copies of the book. So, trying to be a promoter of a book and also a writer, I want to be able to write books. So, this maybe this show will will take an interest in Tabasco the Saucy Raccoon. I'll give you I'll give you everybody half price. Everybody that writes in half price for the book. Um, the uh, Tabasco the Saucy Raccoon, um, uh, I, 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 what is she thinking? Oh, no, I, I, you can, I, I had ran a contest with this. Well, what is she thinking? I asked in the contest and people gave me, I thought, I thought, oh, my aching, somebody said, and I thought too, oh, my aching head. And I thought, gee, I've got to, I've been thinking this now for many years. I should send this to picture to Mr. Tylenol. For headaches, you know, I might get a million dollars. It'd be better than writing a book, wouldn't it? <laughs> and but but I, when I actually, what I think is, oh no, not another picture. Because I, when I had the raccoon, I was always taking pictures of the raccoon. Um, but they didn't want to put pictures in the book; they wanted to put illustrations instead. So there's only not too many pictures in that book uh, behind. It's another story we talk about the illustrator. But so um, I got this. Everything is. Uh, it's just on the minute I run into these things. I was a student at the Simon Fraser University doing a graduate degree and um, the Vancouver Zoo phoned me, Stanley Park Zoo phoned me and said, would you look after this orphan raccoon? Because they'd had a rash of raccoons in Kitsilano and, um, and the mother, Tabasco's mother and, uh, and siblings were all shot, but not Tabasco. She was meant to be, I guess. So I took her to my no pet apartment. The, the lady said, we don't allow dogs and we don't allow cats. She never asked me, did I have a raccoon? So I had, I lived with a raccoon for a year in, uh, in um, Simon Fraser University. Um, and, uh, but the two weeks, a week before I, a week after I got Tabasco to look after, um, I'm divorced now and I'm by myself and living in the, in the apartment. Uh, I was going on a promotion tour for another book called um, There's a Raccoon in My Parka. And 
this is my this is another book about another uh, about a raccoon called Rocky. It's it's actually about sea otters, but um, because nobody knew about sea otters at that point, I was invited up to Alaska to help bring sea otters back to British Columbia after they were extinguished, and um, uh, and so it's more than. But I took the raccoon with me. So the raccoon, it's a Rocky raccoon, traveled with me for two thousand miles between Victoria and Alaska to bring sea otters back to British Columbia and uh, and so now all these years later I get another raccoon and it's called uh, Tabasco and I'm on the way across Canada on 17 airplane flights <laughs> so um, uh, that's not as, as interesting a story but it's on a promotion tour so for people who are looking at this program that are writers it would be good to read the uh, the chapter in Tabasco the saucy raccoon called uh, there's a raccoon on my promotion tour because um, Tabasco, where there's most, a lot of people hate raccoons, to, everybody loved Tabasco. There's a raccoon on my promotion tour. Oh. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's every day. Um, in fact, we were, we were on the uh, Jimmy Fallon show. Um, and, oh, um, yes. I, I actually was, saw that. I was recently on the Jimmy Fallon show, but they, they um, were, had my books there and they said, um, um, oh, anyway, but the important one for this book was that, the recruit Tabasco and I were went on the um, uh, Alan Thicke show, and uh, they had all these Hollywood actors and actresses on the show as well, including Telly Savalas, and um, uh, and so Tabasco um, was the hit of the show, <laughs> not Telly Savalas and this other Hollywood actress whose name I've forgotten because he he was uh, I didn't have him in a cage. I don't have these I don't have these animals in cages. They just they're just following me. And so he got bored with listening to Telly Savalas and this Hollywood actress and what they were doing. And he jumped, he, he, he jumped, he, he scooted away. And the cameraman was found it more interesting to chase Tabasco than to <laughs> than the guests that were coming up from Hollywood. So <laughs> there was a, rather a, an interesting um, conversation. It was interesting. But anyway, I talk about that in the book too. That's just one of one of the things that I think about on the promotion tour. So as, as you were writing this book, what was the most difficult part of it for you? The end. Mm -hmm. uh, the end. The end. Um, it's easy. Uh, this, oh, I wrote this book uh, very much longer. I wrote longer, but they wanted to, um, <clears throat> and I have a box of this much, much longer when I wrote it. <clears throat> and the uh, publisher wanted she said, there's more of a market for children's books than there is for adult books. So she said, I want you to, we're gonna cut it. So they cut it from here to here. Mm -hmm. this, this would have been like that, that, that kind of a book. And now it's thin um, and they, but they, it's still, you wouldn't know that that has been cut. Uh, it was well edited um, and that was to make it. And then they, they didn't want to put pictures in it. They wanted to put illustrations and the illustrations in that book um, are unique because the illustrator came and spent on a two week tour around the schools with me um, and she traveled 200 miles to see me and all she wanted was to take a picture of my hands when I'm smuggling the raccoon on these 17 airplane flights and the book you know, beginnings and endings are easy for me and beginnings and endings are the most important part of the books in my opinion so this this just says this is the first paragraph I'm at the Vancouver airport ready buying a ticket for the raccoon. Oh, I think I've got the book, the box. Oh, no, I've got, I've done a lot. I've actually, I've actually done a lot of smuggling. I've written two articles in Reader's Digest on smuggling and nobody's put me in jail yet. I've smuggled a peregrine falcon in my first week of marriage, second on the way home from that first knowing, getting David, marrying David. I had, I had a bird in there and you can, the bird crap's still in there. That's, that's 96, 19. 60 did I say and then I've got a big box in another room um which um uh, in which I smuggled the I, I, raccoon but I, I just I it's a I'm at the I'm at the Vancouver airport and, and, and instead of the picture there's a, a illustration two tickets to Toronto please for me and my pet raccoon I said to the lady at the Air Canada ticket counter in Vancouver. I tried to sound nonchalant as if this was something I asked for every day. She looked up startled and then drew back in alarm as I placed the wooden box in front of her. Yes, I know he has to go in the baggage compartment, so I brought my own carrying case, unless of course you want me to use yours. 
The lady behind the ticket counter stared at the box as if any minute she expected it to explode. I felt that if she'd been in a bank, she would have reached under the counter for the alarm. Did you say raccoon? Not really believing that I had one. Here I said, reaching into the pocket of my parka and pulling out a red woolen toque, meet Tabasco. Oh, she says. <laughs> um, the lump of grizzled fur snuffling sleepily into the wool in the palm of my hand looked more like a pincushion than a one pound, weak old orphan raccoon. The airline lady's manner changed immediately. It's just a baby, she crooned. It's adorable. <clears throat> then remembering where she was, she looked horrified. You can't put that little raccoon in the baggage compartment in that box. It's too tiny. It might die. Well, what do you suggest? I asked innocently. Looking around to make sure nobody is listening, she says, wrap it up in, in, a, in a, wrap, wrap it up in a blanket and pretend it's your baby. Now it's my turn to look horrified. I certainly had a baby and, and I had two bags of baby supplies. Somehow I couldn't take Tabasco through security as a baby human. I had another plan. And if you want to know what the plan is, you're going to have to read the book. But so the beginning, beginnings have to be good. And that's, I think, is a good beginning. It is the beginning. And then my life with Tabasco and then a sad ending to her life, which I'm not going to tell you about. Now, one famous writer, I can't remember, he said, if you're writing about a wild animal, you can't, you have to stop before the, and it dies. You can't have, I hear it a bit more poetically than this, you can't have the death at the end. You have to stop before the last chapter. But I write nonfiction and I want people to, I say only the truth and I want, I have to go the whole way. But when, so the hardest part is the ending. However, in, in several cases, when I have included, when there has two cases, when there has been an ending like that, it has worked. I have, in well, this, this case, I'll tell you, I haven't got time for all of them, just this case. And, and I, I had to struggle with the ending. What, what am I going, how am I going to do this? What am I going to say? Because it, it's a lesson in the ending. And people should learn that lesson. And so I walked out of the house wondering, this house here, here in Lansville, what, how am I going to do this? I know what they want me to do. I, don't want, I, I want to tell the truth. And there, the first time in about 10 years, there was a blind raccoon sitting right outside my kitchen door. I've never seen any raccoon in 10 years of living here on Lanceville on um, Nanus Bay. And there was this blind raccoon, one eye, looking straight at me. And I went inside and I told the ending. And you'll have to read it for yourself to make up your decision, but I think it's a good ending. But mm -hmm. things happen to me, like if you think or pray enough, the answer will come. And uh, I told the truth, but if I'd listened to that writer, famous writer, I would have stopped before the ending and had a happy ending, but that wouldn't be the truth. So I, I know that you take your book into um, into classrooms. Well, you know, not not currently under under the pandemic restrictions, but um, what kind of response do you get from oh. from the students? Perfect. And the teachers and the parents come along as well. I have, I live in, I've got three messy offices in here and I was just boxes and boxes of, uh, of this, this is just the first one. I've got boxes and boxes of papers. I really need an administrative assistant, <laughs> Suzanne, to get an administrative assistant. <laughs> Anyone who will see how much I can pay them. Um, and look, the, these are, this is, the, oh, I have to I'll bring this one. This is uh, Tabasco made the front page of the Vancouver Sun. She was a celebrity raccoon. These are lessons from a raccoon. Another front page from Catherine Standard. It's a very, all these are just, just some of her press clippings. And then and in another room, I still have the stories of the children that they wrote because I made them write diaries. 
I made them write diaries and, um, and, and, and be in groups and read around the groups and tell stories around the groups. I made up my own curriculum. I was lucky, lucky. Um, um, I, taught, I taught how we were learning. Well, I didn't realize Australia had such a good education. And, um, but I taught how I taught in Australia. Um, I was, uh, I'm ne I guess I've never had a normal class. I, they were all, I, my, I came to a Canada in Vancouver and within a few, I did some substituting and then I was given this class of 25 students that were picked out, all eight years old, and they were picked out from all over Vancouver and the parents would drive them to my class. And we were given the basement of Lord Kitchener School in Vancouver. And I, I had, you know, I had, I, 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 we decided, um, we decided the curriculum. And a lot of it is talking and, and talking and writing. And, uh, and we divide into groups. Um, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the curriculum, but we, I wanted to know about Vancouver. So we would get the parents and drive around Vancouver and we would prepare for a project and prepare to go to a printing house or something. And then we would come back and write about it. And then, um, and that's the same, same as I taught in Australia. I had to teach, I had to, t my job in Australia was to take it out of college and to eradicate the Australian accent and have all the Australians talk like the queen. I obviously failed in that job. <laughs> but when people call me in Australia and they know by my accent, I really know I failed. But, um, but the, uh, and, and that, and I, and it was terrible. I had to teach high school kids, high school boys, how to talk like the queen. I mean, these pe people in the, down in the ocean and playing footy and all. It, I, the first three months I went home crying in the bus and then I said what am I learning speech for what am I teaching writing for what job these these teenagers are interested in jobs so we 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 um um what we listed what are the jobs that you need good speech for you know, did you need good writing for and so we acted out like interviews and we, so we divide into pairs one was the interviewer one was the interviewee we and that that was my that was my curriculum preparing and I taught I taught English speech and writing through real life experiences. But all my teaching has what I've been has been what I've decided to do. I've and they've got away with it. And with when I've um, when I had the animals, well then we had we learnt about the animals. And when there was only one book on gibbons, well I pretended I was a it's an eight year old. I pretended I was a um, uh, a professor and I was giving a lecture because I've had the only book and we didn't have computers and making copies and all that thing, thing. And so they had to write notes. They had to write precis. They had to ask me questions. So it's another real life experience. So the, a lot of these, this stuff is the, the stories and poems that the children wrote are, are in these books. Um, one child is a, one child in love affair with a cougar. If you can get it, there's only two copies of left of this, but this child uh, is eight years old. And these are all, the eight-year-old Stephen, I've changed his name. Um, and these kids are all, um, they, if you go to, if you go to um, the Facebook page for the kids of Monterey, kids of, kids of Monterey at Monterey Elementary School, is now a media, intermediate school, but when I was there, it was elementary school. And I had uh, all, all the animals in there. Um, and um, uh, I forgot. <laughs> so many things to say. I've forgotten what, what, what the point was now. What the point I'm trying to make? The children, they have um, this. Uh, this eight-year-old, this this um, he he was he was thrown out of eighteen classrooms, and he was eight. Nobody wanted him. I can get you. And he came to my class, and I couldn't teach him either until I gave him a cougar to take home. He took a cougar. The runt of the litter was taken to the runt of the class in a way. Uh, I changed his name in the book. And I, I gave two more cougars to, to kids. And for four months, they had the cougars home in their class. And they would bring, bring them to school and go back again. And I line up the teachers and they take them tobogganing and skiing. And there's pictures like that in the book. Uh, and I kept the blind one, Tom. And that's my love affair with a cougar. I, I kept, one was blind. I kept the, the blind one at home. The other three were given away to the kids for three months. What experiences and what beautiful poetry they wrote. Now, some of them are just dum de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum But this was Stephen, the one he rarely spoke and he never smiled. The day the cougars came to school, Stephen smiled. It was like the opening of a beautiful flower. It looked like the beginning of a whole new world. 
he made contact with something outside himself and it was good. He observed like the rest of us, but he saw more. And this is the poem he wrote. And this is one of the ones that I can understand. There's some that have got so many illusions and classical illusions and things like that I don't understand. This is the one I just happened to open to or read it. But there are other ones that I don't understand that are far higher, of, you know, like university. With eyes wide open, his ears pricked, the cougar cub explores the room. At first, he does not seem to notice that he is not in a cave. But then he sees the children who just will not behave. He starts to walk towards them, but at once he is picked up. He's shoved inside a desk with no room to crawl about. He sees a crack, and through it he creeps. He gives a jump, and he is away. And now to the dark places he will always stay. And the runt of the litter was, was he, he chose and took home. And he just flowered and joined the classroom after a while. And there's other poems in there that, uh, are, like, I won't say Shakespeare, but, you know, they're, they're far adult poets mm -hmm. so that keeps me alive is having these experiences and writing about them well that is um i mean that's a wonderful story lynn and unfortunately we're coming to the end of our time but um if if people want to come and talk to you about um tabasco or any of your books um they can find you at the askew creek bookshop um i I believe you are there on some on Friday, Fridays. Friday the 9th. I'll be Friday there. the 9th. Friday the 9th is when I'm there next for the whole day. Okay, so on Friday, April 9th, Lynn will be at the Askew Creek Bookshop in the Shimanus Public Market. So if you're interested in finding out some more about her books, and uh, she has more than one book in the store, um, and they're all very interesting. And I'm sure she'd be happy to talk to you. And I'll be, I might go dressed as a raccoon. Oh, <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for giving us your time here. And um, I, I wish you a lot of luck with, um, with all of your boxes of books. I'm sure that they'll go flying off the shelf because it's such a great story.